Hi, it's Christine Mache from my eLearning Multimedia Project. I review chapters 4, 5, and 6 from Digital Habitats. There was quite a bit of content in these chapters, so I tried my best to focus on the main points. Um, I did include a bunch of charts to help you that were in the book. So let's get started. Chapter 4's focus was on constructing digital habitats, community experience, and technology configurations. So they highlight uh, what a community of technology is and different configurations. And that you'll see it goes along with tools, features, and platforms. So let's start. What is a habitat? This is what we know to be a habitat with animals. Defined, a habitat is a place or a type of place where a plant or animal naturally or normally lives or grows. Now, let's look at that from a digital perspective. What is a digital habitat? A digital habitat is the portion of community's habitat that is enabled by configuration of technologies. Try to look at your day and how technology is involved and the things that you do every day and how each thing is intertwined to help make everything work together. That is the main idea here. The constitution of that habitat are tools that are specific to community activities, platforms into which vendors and developers package tools, features that help make platforms usable and livable, and the configuration of technologies that sustains the habitat. Here you see a chart from page 39 in your text that shows tools that help support the community. Here you can see how with the wiki board you have discussion and wiki tools that help make it function. And then up here, web board, you have a member directory, you have a discussion again and chat. So all these things help support community. Now platforms are things that package tools. Here you have the same types of examples, but with a different layout. You can see there's the wiki platform, web board platform, VOP platform. And these all um, are bundled together to help make people's habitats digitally connected. Features that make technology usable. Now that means each of these platforms can have different features that make it usable. For example, here on a web board, you have email, you have author picture, um, discussion views, new flags. Um, think of something like a Facebook. You can picture all of these features that make it usable. Um, example to here, wiki, um, having page history, and so on. So they make technology usable. The next focus was configuration of these technologies, how they can all be grouped to work together. Now when we integrate all of these habitats, we can see that I just took a little example of activities, tools, and features. For example, ongoing community conversations can involve discussion and they can have features that are multi-threaded. Um, communication of key events can have file storage and they can also have an email interface. So everything can be linked together and you can see that's broken down in activities, tools, and features. Now let's move on to chapter 5. Making sense of the technology landscape. How does technology provide functionality to support activities and support a community's dynamics? This is really important because we see how technology has influenced our lives. Well, how can it support the community of learning? Um, think about that each day um, if you're an educator or if you have another type of job or profession and how technology fits into your community and how it supports it. Now, important thing here are rhythms, interactions, identities. By rhythms, you think of togetherness and separation. Well, how does that apply to you? Well, think about our class. We have times where there's togetherness, where we might be doing a web conference, or there might be some separation, where we're possibly doing a project. And the same thing goes on with interactions and identities. Um, here we have individual and group. 
when last week when we did our voice threads, we responded individually and then listened as a group um, and responded and lis after listening to each of other people in our group. Um, this week, we collaborated as a group um, and created questions and then responded. So when you have a community, you have different degrees of interaction. Here's another chart that can explain that. Um, so sometimes your digital community or habitat can have love togetherness as well as separation. Um, same thing with participation. And that means your, your arrow, if you had to move one way or another, it can change. It doesn't always have to be the same. Again, look at our class. We've had activities that are together. Some are separate. Um, some are done as individuals. Some are as groups. So each thing can change back and forth, and they all make our e-learning community. This is a popular chart that is in our text um, in Chapter 5, the Tools Landscape. It's very detailed. I kind of call it the donut chart. And if you look at the donut in the middle, um, it's a region of tools with interactions. And at the top, we have tools that support we have tools that support participation in conversations. In the bottom, we have tools that support creation, storing, and sharing. And in the center and the outer band, we have a parallel polarity between group and individual. And the outer band is pretty much a focus on the individual. So this is a really good chart, very detailed. And you can analyze it from several different perspectives. All right, let's move up to Chapter 6. So now that we've built up Chapters 4 in looking at platforms, features, tools, and configurations, and then we talked about community, how it can vary um, from togetherness to doing things more individual or group. And we saw how that can be ever-changing to make a community of digital learning work. And now we're going to move into these activities and tools and how it is important for a successful community to have technologies that support its key orientations. Now there are nine main orientations. One, meetings. Two, open-ended conversations. Three, projects. Four, content. Five, access to expertise. Six, relationships. Seven, individual participation, community cultivation, and serving the content. When I looked at this, and the chapter basically breaks down each orientation, it really made me reflect on our class. And in our class, we have meetings. We have open-ended conversations, whether they are in writing or voice threads um, or discussion board. We have projects. We have content. We have access to expertise. We have relationships that we build. Sometimes it's individual participation. Sometimes it's community cultivation and serving a content. And keep in mind, these orientations in a community aren't fixed. They can change, and they can emerge into different things. Look at how, since the beginning of class, as we got to know each other, um, we've built on the um, orientations that we had. And they can change over time. So they're really important. Now here you can see a potential configuration of technologies. I took this chart from your text, um, and it's for community's orientation to meetings. Sorry, the page number is actually not showing from this slide. Um, as you can see, it, everything works together, from working as community, nurturing tools, publishing tools, calendar, and it all makes a community function. Now, um, for conclusion, kind of ending chapters 4, 5, and 6, two main things that I wanted to point out was, first, the format of community orientation is important because it places technology in the context of the design of activities. And this is really important, and the, I thought about this with two prime examples. One, if you take a look at a wealthy district and then a low-income district of students. 
Now, your wealthy district of students are going to have a different configuration of technology in their community and habitat than the lower income district might have. For example, students in the higher income district would be able to go home and have readily available good working Wi-Fi, many technology tools that they can use, and usually have higher end products. That, so if they had to do learning on that level, it wouldn't be much of a problem. And so designing for that community could be based on what they have. Then you might go to a lower income um, population where when they're in school, they might have certain tools that they might not have at home. So when you're designing for that community, your e-learning might have to be configured differently to support that community. And looking at these perspectives, we can support and imagine the appropriate application of technology for all of our communities. So finally, I want to thank you for being a part of the community and letting, allowing me to share this review with you. So have a great day. Thanks.